Uh, good morning, everybody, and welcome to the 24th meeting in this year of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee. Before we move to the first item on the agenda, I'd like to remind everyone present to switch off their mobile phones, etc., as they can affect the broadcasting system. Uh, you may notice some committee members using tablets and so on, but that's because they provide meeting papers on them. Uh, agenda item one is a decision on taking business in private. This first item is for the committee to decide whether consideration of its work programme, that is item five, should be taken in private. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Uh, that being so, we will take it in private. Agenda item two is subordinate legislation. And uh, the item is for members to take evidence from the Minister on the Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Amendment Regulations 200, uh, 2014 draft. The instrument has been laid under the affirmative procedure, which means Parliament must approve it before provisions may come into force. Following this, this evidence session, the committee will be invited uh, to consider the motion to approve the instrument under agenda item three. So uh, this morning, I welcome the minister, Paul Wheelhouse. Good morning. With uh, two of his officials, George Burgess, the deputy director for environmental quality, and Rob Morris, uh, SEPA sponsorship and pollution reduction team leader in the Scottish Government. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, I wonder if the Minister would like to speak to the instrument. I, I would, Convener, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone, and thank you for the opportunity to provide an opening statement on the draft uh, Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014 before you today. Uh, along with other parts of the UK, Scotland is required to transpose uh, Article 14, Paragraphs 5 to 8 of the Energy Efficiency Directive in Scotland by the 5th of June uh, 2014. Uh, the Energy Efficiency Directive establishes a common framework and lays down rules to promote improvements in energy efficiency. The specific requirements of Article 14, paragraphs 5 to 8, relate to a cost-benefit analysis being carried out when a new or refurbished thermal electricity generation, industrial or energy production installation is planned. Uh, exemption thresholds and exclusions are set out in the draft regulations. Uh, Scotland will be consistent with the other parts of the UK on these aspects of the directive. For example, where there is too little waste heat available, uh, no demand for heat exists, or uh, it is too far distance-wise for a viable connection to be made, uh, there is no need uh, to carry out a cost-benefit analysis. Furthermore, certain peak load and backup electricity generating installations, nuclear power stations and carbon capture and storage installations are exempt. The draft regulations make this clear and this clarity will be of benefit uh, to business. When a cost-benefit analysis is required, this will ensure that high efficiency co-generation, the recovery of waste heat and connection to a district heating and cooling network are identified. Where the cost-benefit analysis shows it is beneficial, SEPA will then issue a permit with conditions that will ensure the measures are implemented. We are late in transposing because we wanted to be consistent with our UK counterparts on the technical detail uh, and to enable the responses to the consultation earlier this year to be fully considered. Uh, the timetable for transposition was tight in that there were just seven months available from the publication of the European Commission's own guidance on Article 14. This guidance was important as it clarified aspects of the Director's meaning and therefore what the draft regulations needed to cover. Uh, one other administration in the UK has laid their draft regulations, that being Northern Ireland, and I understand they did so last night. Um, uh, England and Wales will follow in October. The route chosen for transposition in Scotland is via amendment of the Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Regulations 2012, or PPC. PPC provides a ready-made framework for implementation and is familiar to the vast majority of operators affected. This is because their installations already require a permit under the PPC regulations. They are also familiar with the Scottish Environment Protection Agency, or SEPA, as the, the regulator. While Scotland will be the first to transpose the requirements in the UK, we believe, or possibly overtaken by Northern Ireland, given their last-minute uh, move last night, we also made provision for the delay in transposition by issuing directions to SEPA. Uh, I propose to the committee that these draft regulations are the right mechanism to transpose the requirements of the directive and would ask for your support in agreeing them. Uh, finally, the committee should be aware that the draft regulations make a number of minor corrections uh, to errors in the PPC regulations. These introduce no new regulatory burdens. Um, if uh, members have any questions to ask about this just now. Dave Thompson. Uh, good morning, 
Good morning. And welcome to the, the committee. It's just a, a, a very a general point, please, in terms of um, um, you know, uh, ensuring that the Scots, English, Northern Irish and Welsh, um, you know, the, 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 the criteria are the same. Is, is there a particular mechanism that is applied in relation to ensuring that uh, these things are, uh, are the same in, in each of the individual countries? Or is it a matter of the first country that decides the rest fall into line? Are, are there discussions to agree a common approach. I just wonder how it actually works in practice. Uh, certainly. Uh, my understanding is it's, it's usually the latter. I mean, there's, there's very good engagement between officials in the four administrations about uh, when a new directive comes out about, OK, sit down and what do we need to do to make sure that we uh, all comply individually, but collectively, you know, how can we coordinate and actually learn from what's being done uh, across the four administrations? So um, there is good collaboration between uh, officials uh, in our administration and those in Northern Ireland, Wales and England uh, to ensure that uh, there's a common understanding and you know, obviously share understanding of what the regulations actually mean, and which is why it's so important we had to wait for the, for the guidance from the European Commission itself so we knew what, to, what, the, what the intent was from the Commission and how to interpret the, the directive. So, so in, this, in this, this case uh, is a good example of how that collaboration works and um, it's, although I may have made, it made uh, light of it, I mean, it's not a competitive situation um, with the administrations. We just happen to have been keen to, to, to make sure that we complied yeah. as soon as possible to be um, good, good uh, progressive partners in Europe and be able to demonstrate that we are taking the uh, directive seriously. But uh, other administrations similarly are trying to do their best to, to comply with the deadlines. Uh, but it's been good collaboration between officials. I don't know whether George or Rob want to discuss the actual detail, how that works in practice, but um, it's certainly uh, a positive positive engagement between the departments. I don't think there's, I don't think there's much to add to the, the Minister's comments, simply a lot of email exchanges and, and meetings between the, the various uh, administrations around the UK, particularly so that we ensure that the, the, the technical parts of the regulations are as consistent as we can make them across the UK administrations. Alec Ferguson. Um, I just wondered out that in the accompanying notes that we received on this bit of subordinate legislation, um, there is a phrase in order to benefit businesses by having as much uniformity between Scots, English, and Northern Irish law as possible, um, which suggests that there might be some examples where that level of uniformity is not possible. And I just wondered whether that if, is that just a, a useful phrase, or are you aware of any examples where we can't have a, a, a desired level of uniformity, and if so, how that might affect the. The, the legislation going o forward. On the second point, I'll maybe ask, I'll invite George to, to comment in a second, but I mean, the, obviously the intent is to try and, uh, you know, not create unnecessary um, differences yeah, yeah, where, yeah. where it can be avoided. I mean, obviously we've got a European directive which in theory applies across the whole of Europe, and uh, I would hope it's being applied by all governments in Europe. Uh, so it's, uh, we try and work to make sure there's a common understanding and that there's not uh, different interpretations of the of the of the requirements between different administrations and that might that might lead if you had a different interpretation to maybe having a different legal outcome in terms of how the, the regulations are applied so you know to avoid that unnecessary kind of um, uh, cliff edge between one administration and another um, that I think that's essential but I don't know whether George wants to comment on any kind of the legal parameters as to there are any legal differences in Scotland and England in that respect there are as far as we are aware no differences of substance so for example the the table on page six of the regulations setting out the search distances are going to be consistent across the UK. There are differences of form. Um, we're using the pollution prevention and control regulations. Northern Ireland has very similar regulations to that. England and Wales some years ago moved on to a different set of regulations, environmental permitting. So their regulations will look different from those in Scotland and, and Northern Ireland, but in terms of what they are requiring um, operators to do and requiring the regulator to do. There is no difference of, of, of substance. So operators that are perhaps operating across the UK, they'll be able to use very similar guidance, very similar mechanisms for carrying out the cost-benefit analysis. Thank you very much. That's fine. Claudia Beamish. Uh, and uh, good morning to you, Minister, and to, um, to you both. Uh, I wonder if you could explain for me Minister, the, uh, what connections there are between the, the actual planning system 
itself and the, the fact that a cost-benefit analysis will be um, necessary in certain circumstances, just in view of the fact that um, I would be encouraged if there, were, um, there was guidance in, in order to enable these developments to happen in places where they are indeed close um, to communities for um, the, the saving of energy and the use of combined heat and power. Just wonder if there was any comment on that across departments. Um, well, I uh, certainly am aware in, in, in respect of the regulation, how they would be applied. If you have a, a, a plant which is of the kind we describe, um, perhaps it could be anything from a distillery to a power plant, you know, it's maybe needing to, to generate a significant amount of heat and um, I was using fuel, therefore, to do that, uh, that obviously the town and country planning sort of system would, would take that into account and would work from the point of view of um, existing, you know, structure plans and, and local um, uh, you know, district heating sort of strategies and plans that are available at a local authority level take that into account as to whether in the first scanning sort of filtering exercise to decide whether a cost benefit analysis is even needed. Um, it might well say that in this area where this plant is being proposed actually the local authority has plans to develop a district heating network and therefore there's likely to be demand for district heat in that area. Uh, that would then imply perhaps that there wasn't a, a failure of the test in terms of whether there's a market. There may not be a market now, but there could be a market, and therefore it might be uh, necessary to, to deliver a cost-benefit uh, cost analysis to prove one way or the other whether that's actually um, a viable proposition for the, for the uh, plant to take on board. Um, but I don't know whether Rob or George want to add to that in terms, but that, that's my understanding. So there is a linkage with the town plan planning system and, and local district heating mapping and, and strategies, which I, I agree with you is important that they, they talk to each other, these, these processes, but on the technicalities, I don't know whether George or Rob want to comment. Uh, as the Minister said, the, there will be communication between the Town and Country Planning System and the and SEPA's permitting system. They are separate systems, so for the majority of installations, they will require planning permission, they will require a permit from SEPA, and the operator can go about seeking those um, in parallel or, or, or one af after the other. By setting out the, the requirements as clearly as we can in the regulations as to when a cost-benefit analysis is going to be required, the benefit of there is that the operator knows from the outset that one of you know the analysis is going to be required, and therefore the sensible thing to do is right from the start when they're beginning to design their their um, their installation that they have that in mind and 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 plan with that in mind. SEPA always encourage operators to discuss matters with them well in advance of submitting an application anyway. So this is the sort of thing that can be well dealt with at that stage of the process. Can I add one further point, Convener? Uh, Thank you. Um, I, th I think, as, as George has indicated, and I think it's probably implicit in this, if not explicit, that a, a good business doing a good business case for a for investment to their board or to, to uh, other stakeholders, shareholders, will actually look to maximise the financial return from that investment and it would be remiss on them not to take the opportunity, if there was an opportunity, to, to sell waste heat um, to a local market and that would improve the, the developer's yield the, 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 uh, if they were doing that. So the, there's other drivers as well, but you know this is just making sure, I, th I think George has made a very good point, it gives transparency and, and a clarity about what, what they would be required to do and it hopefully it allows them to design that in from the start. I think uh, the only thing I'd add is uh, just leave it. The, um, the only thing I'd add is, is that SEPA is actually producing guidance on how the regulations will work in practice as well um, with flow charts and with necessary information for operators to take on board and, and all of the regimes that apply. So that would be useful, I think, in terms of setting out the, 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 the kind of situations that you described earlier. Nigel Don. carry on where this is leading because um, I understand the regulations would require a business to look at the cost benefit analysis and therefore look at the combined heat and power or whatever it is this takes me back I have to say 30 years and what follows um, it follows directly from my experience 30 years ago you can demonstrate that thermodynamically it's a perfectly sensible thing to do you can demonstrate I did that it would be cost it, there would be a cost benefit in doing it, but you can still get a business that then turn around and say, well, actually, this gives me some complexity I don't want. It gives me some uncertainty I don't want. Therefore, never mind your cost benefit analysis. I'm not going to do it. Is what follows from here that 
the licensing authority, SIPA or whoever, will actually require you to do it? Or is the business still able to say, never mind the rest of you, I don't want to do it, it's too complicated? Uh, well, well the, the, the short answer is that there would be a requirement for the business if, if there was a, you know, if the cost benefit analysis demonstrated that there was a, a sound case to be made for, for that. In, in other words, it wasn't a, uh, a proposal that would destroy the business, destroy the, the project, um, and it would be entirely reasonable. A uh, reasonable person looking at it would say, well, actually, there's a case that there could be district heating network here that could use this, this, this heat and therefore improve the energy efficiency of the plant and the whole project. Then SIPA would be able to, to uh, you know, require the operator to, to take that, uh, take that forward. Um, as to the mechanics of it, then obviously there's a degree to which the company has a decision to make as to how they actually deliver that. Clearly, the SIPA wouldn't direct them as to how they do it, but they would require them to, to, to make use of it. But um, I don't know whether uh, George wants to, uh, to, 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 to tell me I'm wrong there. But um, that's much my understanding of the regulations. I'm interested in the evidence that we have from another source about the increasing emissions from public sector buildings uh, and wondered if there was any pilot planned by any aspect of the public sector to seek waste heat from nearby uh, businesses uh, so that it might be used. And I don't suppose you can probably answer with a particular example just now, but be interesting to know if... Uh, we can set an example by showing how this will work. There are uh, operators, I, I believe, I may be uh, incorrect, you may have a local knowledge that will tell me if I'm wrong about this convener, but I think what General Hospital might be looking at uh, waste heat uh, being used. But there are obviously um, a number of projects involving distillers and, and other operators. Uh, I know in Glasgow there's um, uh, social housing and, and, and uh, I think it's a college campus that are combined. So there are precedents for uh, there's, there's already existing collaboration, so we're not starting from a clean sheet. And this is a, a perhaps better developed in the continent as well. You know, so we've got international comparators where um, public sector and, and social operators will use waste heat from commercial operations to uh, make them more uh, energy efficient. So, uh, but certainly we can come back to, to your convener with some examples if that would be helpful to the committee uh, for its further deliberations on, on energy efficiency measures. It would be very helpful indeed. The Caithness General Hospital um, was one that I was aware of, but I just thought it'd be good to get some examples out there for people to see that we're taking uh, this seriously yeah. from a governmental point of view and from the public sector in general. Absolutely, and, and the point about the public estate is made, well made. I mean, we are constantly looking, SEPA are a good example of it, uh, looking to try and improve their own emissions figures. Well, you know, uh, you know we can seek perfection. Um, uh, it's difficult to deliver in practice, but SEPA and other agencies of government are working extremely hard to try and bring down their, their emissions. It's one of the issues that uh, no doubt will be discussed, and I'm sure Claudia Beamish um, uh, is well aware that these are issues we're looking at in the Public Sector Climate Leaders Forum, and how we can deliver on specific issues like this will, will be subject to further discussion. Well, thank you very much. Are there any other questions, members? Uh, if there are no other questions, then we'll move on to agenda item three. And this is to consider the motion S4M10972, asking the committee to recommend approval of the affirmative instrument Pollution Prevention and Control Scotland Amendment Regulations 2014 draft. Uh, of course, there's room for formal debate of this for up to 90 minutes uh, if there is a need for that. Um, however, I'm asking uh, the Minister to speak to and move the motion. Thank you very much. Invite any members to make any comments that they may wish. Nigel Don. Take up 90 seconds, never mind minutes. Uh, can I say, in, in view of, the, in, of what the Minister has just said about the sort of degree of compulsion that there is in this, I think it's actually very welcome. I would, however, note wearing a previous professional hat that it's like, likely to be quite complicated simply because different bits of the heat input and output may well be in different hands and getting people to actually coordinate may be commercially very difficult. The spirit might be very willing, but it actually might be quite difficult to make it work. So I don't envy SEPA this part of their job any more than I envy them much else that they have to do. Uh, does the Minister wish to sum up uh, at the moment? 
I'll just thank uh, uh, Mr. Don for his, his comments. I mean, we do recognise the complexity, and I think that's something that would be taken into account in the cost-benefit analysis itself as to the deliverability. Um, I'm sure it would be something that would be considered and the cost therein and uh, the complexity therein. Uh, so I have confidence that um, it will be proportionately applied. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I, I thank the member for his comments about SEPA. I know they worked very hard and uh, appreciate his remarks. Thank you very much. Well, I put the question on the motion. That is that the question is that motion S4M 10972 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse be approved. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are agreed. Therefore, the motion has been passed. And uh, I thank the minister and his officials. And uh, we'll change over the uh, group. So we'll take a little break just now. Uh, we now turn to agenda item four, Scotland's climate change targets. And uh, the, this item uh, is for the committee to take evidence from stakeholders on Scotland's climate change targets. Uh, the RACI committee was one of four committees to look at the low carbon Scotland meeting our emissions reduction targets 2013 to 2027. The draft second report on proposals and policies, which is also known as RPP2. Uh, Raki is now going to take a broader view of the RPP2 and the climate change targets in the light of the three successive years of not meeting these targets. 
Next week, the committee will hold an evidence session with the Minister on Scotland's climate change targets. But today, I very much welcome our uh, witnesses, Dr Uta uh, Collier, Team Leader, Devolved Administrations, Committee of Climate Change. Good morning. Chris Woodge, or I hope that's correct, Vice Chair, Sustainable Scotland Network. Good morning. Gina Hanrahan, uh, Climate and Energy Policy Officer of the World Wildlife Foundation, Scotland. Good morning. Uh, Jim Densham, uh, Stop Climate Chaos Scotland. Good morning. And Paula Charlson, uh, Head of Environmental Strategy at, at SEPA. Good morning. So I refer members to the papers uh, that we've had and I'll open the questioning by asking panel members about their views on Scotland's progress to date in cutting climate emissions. Pluses and minuses, how do you think we're doing? Do you wish to start, Uta? Yes. Um, I provided some additional evidence mm -hmm. to the committee because obviously we did a progress report for the Scottish Government in March, but the new emissions data for 2012 came out in June, so we, at the time we were doing the UK progress report, so I provided um, some excerpts from uh, the devolved administration's chapter. Now, what that shows is that, obviously, as you all know, Scotland has missed its target again in for the third year running. You're right, um, but we we do well. A, we outlined some of the issues around. Uh, especially inventory changes, which have been very problematic for some years, but it's, get, it's getting more difficult to, to meet the targets as they were set. Um, we gave an overview of what's happening in, in different sectors as well. So our conclusion, and, and what we did in this report as well, so... Um, Obviously, we, we're looking at the UK as a whole, and this was our report where we had to give um, our assessment of the first carbon budget at UK level, which uh, operated from 2008 to 2012. So the UK, of course, met its first carbon budget, and our conclusion was on Scotland specifically that Scotland made an appropriate contribution to the UK's first carbon budget, and did particularly well in some areas like renewable energy capacity, um, waste targets, etc. So we said that Scotland is actually leading in these areas and certainly doing better than, than England and, and the other devolved administrations. Um, and that overall, though, for Scotland, there is still, it's very challenging to achieve future annual targets. And I'm happy to go into more detail on any of those. Indeed. Obviously. I'm sure that our questioning will lead there. Um, others wish to speak up just now? Just indicate and then we'll put you on right. Gina. Um, WWF was, uh, of course, disappointed to uh, miss those first three targets that, that they, were, they were missed. What counts, of course, in scientific terms is the cumulative amount of emissions in the atmosphere, not our percentage reduction on an annual basis. So in scientific terms, uh, Scotland has to deliver on its annual targets as much as on the percentage reductions. We absolutely acknowledge, as Uta says, that there were inventory changes that have made it uh, increasingly challenging to deliver the targets and we know now as we moved through 2014, 15 and beyond that the targets are getting increasingly challenging to deliver. For us that means uh, that we need to see government come forward with intensified policy effort and we very much welcomed the uh, package of new policy measures that were announced uh, in conjunction with the third missed target in June. That was welcome progress and we were pleased that it was cross-sectoral um, we, we have seen um, uh, variable progress across different sectors of the Scottish economy. So we've seen excellent progress on, on renewable electricity particularly. But we see a need to redouble effort now in other policy areas to intensify effort on, for instance, energy efficiency, on transport, on areas such as renewable heat, if we're going to hit those challenging future targets. Anyone else wish to comment at this stage? Um, yes, Jim. 
Um, just to reiterate from Stop Climate Chaos Scotland's point of view, much of what Gina has said that if you look at their position from 1990, obviously Scotland has made good progress, a downward trend in, in emissions, um, but uh, of course disappointed, very disappointed to have missed those, those three recent targets and um, hoping for the best uh, for the next target that will be will be reported upon um, uh, and as Gina said we're very pleased that the Scottish Government brought forward a, a package of measures to try and readdress, readdress that issue um, and continue to, to work to try to make sure those things are, 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 are taken forward and are, are, are possible and, and help to achieve uh, further reductions. I'll just I'll leave it at that for now. I understand that. Um, yes, anyone else? Um, Nothing in particular that hasn't already been said, I guess, other than I do think, um, Super certainly thinks that the report and policies and proposals is a, a very detailed and should be applauded as a document, actually, in terms of the analysis that's undertaken to, to determine that roadmap. Um, it is disappointing that we failed the targets. And I guess that has to be down to how we deliver it. Scotland delivers it. It's not just about Scottish government's delivery as well. I think... Uh, there's something to be said for to um, spread that responsibility across other parts of Scotland, uh, public sector, private sector and other sectors too. And I think that's where the concerted effort could be made in terms of delivery. Okay. Um, yeah. Sustainable Scotland Network. Um, I agree with all of the comments made about, yeah, it is disappointing. It's a bit like school reports, could do better. Um, but... Where we're particularly focusing is trying to improve on the quality of reporting. Um, we work across the whole of the Scottish public sector now, so we've been working with local authorities, with wider public sector, to see what we can do to make sure we've got the absolute best quality reporting so when the information feeds into the RPP and aligned with RPP, we can actually deliver good quality data that helps to make sure we do fully understand and our politicians and... Uh, management understand what the issues are. Are you getting accurate information? We're improving, I would say. Um, we've been doing work, sort of, on the national scale to, to try and get a better understanding of what the what the data actually means. Um, there's an awful lot of data out there, and you do need to have a decent understanding of how it's developed and what it actually means. Um, as an authority down in Dumfries and Galloway, I think we, if you look at deck stats, we're on about a third of a tonne per person. But we've got a lot of agriculture down there, and we don't have a lot of industry. So we've still got a long way to go in terms of our housing stock. We've got major challenges there and all that sort of thing. So yeah, we do need to actually have that better quality data. It's coming. Um, we're developing it. Um, it's been developed from a range of other organisations. So I think it will... I guess the national stats will catch up with what's happening on a sort of local status. We know what we do to the last kilowatt within the, within the organisation. I think that's probably standard across local authority, whether it's CRC uh, driven or otherwise. But the national stats are improving slowly and we will catch up. It's interesting, you know, we formulated these uh, figures and targets in 2009 and agreed them then. Uh, and this change in the, the, me the measurements because of our under better understanding you know, has clearly made a big difference about whether we can hit those targets. So can we get those misses of the targets in perspective uh, at all? I mean, people mention it all the time, you missed your target, and it's important for us to have these annual targets in order to G people up. But can we uh, make sure that when we're answering questions and seeking answers, that we're looking at the bits of uh, the, the whole equation that are actually falling down and they're not doing as well as they should? And, uh, you know, taking the point that Paula made, can we try and focus some of our answers on improving the delivery from some of these areas that are missing rather than just looking at the, the targets as such? Yes, do you know? I would absolutely agree with you, Convener. I think um, while it's important to recognise the, the missed targets and to understand the accounting behind them, what's crucial is that we're making real economy-wide momentum um, right across the board in Scotland so that we're seeing a linear reduction, not necessarily at the same pace, in transport, in energy efficiency in our built environment, 
in electricity right across the board and you know that we're concentrating as much on implementation and not getting distracted from delivery by obsessing around the minutia of, of individual targets while we think it's still critically important to meet them in scientific terms and political terms for the global process as much as domestically. Thank you for that. Um, Claudia Beamish want to come in? No, and good morning to you all. It, it was to follow up on um, Chris on your point about data and I'd like to ask about um, any work that you or other members on the panel today know about which is looking at the compatibility of data um, uh, across the public sector and beyond uh, so that figures can be pulled in because obviously it's very difficult to um, to make any sensible coherent remarks about how we're going forward um, or perhaps less possible I would correct myself <laughs> um, uh, if, if um, the data can't be um, inputted in a similar way um, we've been doing some work with through SSN working with a company called Ether um, to get a better understanding of the the top line sort of data but on the day-to-day -day basis all 32 local Scottish local authorities return a report on our climate change declaration uh, which has been going on for about five years and that's gradually evolving well it's evolved over the last few years so it now reflects what's in the RPP um, this year's reports which we're doing in November will be the first time that's sort of properly in line with RPP and should start to give us a much more consistent approach to uh, reporting from our local authorities in particular and wider public sector have a similar sort of mechanism to use so there is starting to be a consistent sort of level, pla level playing field of um, reporting information and that picks up on things like CRC reports um, it looks at what's happening across the wider public, you know, the wider community. Some authorities are doing a lot of work on that, others are doing less. So it will need to change a little bit to reflect different priorities within different authorities and different, bit, different organisations. But yes, the aim is to have a much more consistent approach. And it's, it's taken a few years to get there, but we are starting to get there. And I guess as RPP develops, will probably evolve, will still evolve towards a, not a, so we all have a sort of required standard to get to in terms of our reporting, but recognising the differences in approach from different authorities and different agencies. I want to develop some of these points with other questions, but uh, Jim Densham, finally. In terms of compatibility, it's something that um, SCCS has asked for, and I know the, the committee had this in their last report, but that we really need to see good read across between the RPP2 and the figures within that and the budget which comes out. And it's not always very easy to, to read across to know if we are achieving through the budget um, what is needed to achieve uh, the RPP2 commitments. Um, I particularly look at um, uh, the land use sector for uh, as I work for RSPB Scotland for our, for our partners in SCCS and I you know keep a focus on that and it's very difficult when the budget comes out because there is very difficult to see that read across and to know if if there is the money in place to achieve what we want to see in the RPP2 in terms of the rural land use sector but those things as you would expect um Graham Day uh, you know, it's accepted of course that, that hitting the initial targets was the easy bit and that as we move forward, it'll become increasingly difficult uh, to maintain that. Therefore, how realistic is it to believe we'll hit future targets? Uh, and is there a, a justification in, in light of the impact of the baseline review for adjusting the targets? Or do we simply do, as Paul, uh, Paul Charleston suggested, um, redouble our efforts and demand an appropriate contribution to this process from all parts of the public private sector and pursue the wider behavioural change that we all want? Okay, let me, I mean, I've been, I've been thinking about this and then some <laughs> back, back of the envelope uh, calculations this morning. Okay, one, I think one pro major problem we're going to see is next year, because when we gave the advice for the targets, um, we had to make an assumption about the EU emissions trading system and the share of Scotland's cap. Now, at the time, there was a accepted methodology which DEC had developed, but really we didn't know anything. Uh, we didn't know how this, this is a new phase that comes in in 2013. We didn't know how that would work out. Actually, we still don't know exactly. But it looks like um, we're, 
we're going to end up with a cap for Scotland, uh, which will be quite different from the one we based our targets on. Now, we'll probably lose another million tonnes or something like that. I mean, just ballpark figures, in addition to all the inventory changes. But let's just take one million tonnes we might be short of next year. I think you would need to so take energy efficiency as a nice compensatory measure. You might have to insulate all of Scotland's solid wall homes and all the outstanding cavity wall homes to get one million tonnes of savings. Five to ten billion tonnes of uh, five to ten billion pounds, maybe. And obviously, you can't do this kind of thing in one year. Okay, that is just one measure, and there, there, there could be other measures. But I think it's a, a really, really difficult challenge. So we, um, as the committee, would be very happy to look at this in more detail and provide the Scottish government with some independent advice on what should be done about the targets. We haven't got a firm position. We said in our last progress report it's something you might need to look at. And we know that apart from the EU ETS issue, there are more inventory changes coming. It's like at the moment we're chasing a moving target. I think we need to consider what's, what's possible. I'm just concerned that making up such a huge shortfall would be very, very difficult. Jim Jenkins. Um, has already um, alluded to this, that what we have to remember is that um, you know, we're trying to achieve a world with, a, with only a two degrees rise uh, into the safe levels of climate change, or hopefully less than that. And that's about the absolute amount of carbon dioxide or equivalent in the atmosphere. And our targets are all about the actual amount, the fixed amount that Scotland can emit on a year by year basis. It's not about how much we uh, reduce in a percentage term because what's actual in the atmosphere is the really important thing. And so it's, it's vitally important that we try and keep to those fixed targets so that we're saying to the, to the world, you know, we have the most ambitious targets. We have fixed our targets about exactly how much we want to emit into the atmosphere, and we are going to try to stick to that. We're not going to change things as the, as the accounting changes. And after all, as Uta says, the inventory is likely to change again and again in future years. So in two years' time, are we going to keep changing it and keep changing um, the, 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 the baseline level and say, well, uh, figures, you know, rightly, the figures show that uh, 1990 was a different amount of uh, carbon in the atmosphere, but actually we're going to change our, our, our targets now. I think it's totally right to leave the things as we are and, and to go for, to, to have a real concerted effort. After all, more than 2,000 people marched in Edinburgh just the other week to say that we really need to have climate action and, and not change targets, but to have real action to achieve those targets. Did you want to I, I, I do indeed, because I, I'm, whilst I sympathise with that position, given the comments that we've just heard from Dr Collier, we go back to the point of how realistic is it now to achieve those targets, living in the real world. We can, we can all aspire to do much better, and we should, but in reality, can we hit the targets? And given what we've just heard, the answer is probably not. I think to, to come back on that, I think uh, it, it may be very difficult. It will be very difficult. But equally, we know that um, putting action in place now is easier to achieve target reduction than it is to do it in 10, 20 mm -hmm. 30 years time as we approach 2050, it's much harder and more costly to do it at that point. Mm. So the more we can do now and really aim to achieve, um, then we should do that. And we know that, you know, after the last, uh, in June, you know, the, the government did come up with new measures to, to uh, try and achieve more. And that hasn't been factored into the RPP2 yet. And, and there are other things that can be done, and we would like to, you know, help government to, to see new policies come forward and, and to move the proposals that we have in the RPP2 into policies as soon as possible to make that happen um, at the earliest possible point to, make, to try to close that gap. It is, you know, very important. I think that before we start looking at changing the targets and, and saying, you know, can we do it? Is it difficult? I think we should try to review the RPP2 and see exactly you know what, what we can achieve well with what we've got um, 
Dave Thompson on this point, and then I'll bring in Paula as well. Uh, thank you, Convener. Uh, just a, kind of a, a broader point in terms of um, taking the public with us, um, because an awful lot of the public out there won't understand the intricacies. It's a very complex subject that we have here. And if you just stick to the targets, knowing that it's virtually impossible to meet them, you're going to create a situation where a lot of expenditure is going to be needed to move forward. The public are going to see money being spent on this at the same time as they're going to see money maybe being cut from local government services and various other things. And yet the headlines every year are going to be government misses target again. So that's all very, very negative. And is there not a danger there might be a backlash from the general public to say, look, you're spending all these millions to try to meet these targets. You're not succeeding, so you're obviously not getting it right. You're, you, you've got something really, really wrong here. Whereas if the, if the targets were made more realistic, given the, the change in, in, uh, changes in what's happened, and we were meeting the target targets because of that or getting very close to it, you're actually encouraging people to then know and believe that it's worthwhile what you're doing. So is there not a great danger if you don't change the targets that you alienate an awful lot of the public who will say, I'd rather have the money spent on schools and hospitals and so on than on something that's patently not working? If I can come back on that, I think... Uh you, you got it right at the beginning that the public doesn't really understand it. I don't think the public really notices. Um, you, you know, so if <laughs> the, the last three years when it said that, um, you know, we've missed our targets, I'm sure most people just skimmed past that page on the, on the website or in, in the little bit in the newspaper because it doesn't get the, the, uh, you know, the, the press coverage that it should achieve. And that's, you know, partly the fault of all of us. I think what what the point that we need to do is to say we all need to agree to work together in the whole of Scotland, as Paula said, to come together and say we, these targets are achievable. We all need to chip in instead of just like looking across budgets and, and departments and saying, well, we think we can do this. We think we can do that. We need to be a much more concerted, bigger effort to say this is where we've got to get to. What's the cost effective approach to achieve that, that, that trend? And, and I think that uh, uh, when we do that, uh, and, and if there are new targets that are missed, as, you know, obviously the next one might be, you never know, um, then we need to be positive about it. Uh, in the SCCS in the last, um, in June, when we did miss that target, were positive about, we tried to focus on the measures that were, that had, the government had proposed, rather than saying, look, this is terrible that we've missed another target. We were, we were trying to be positive to say, this has been missed, but government has strived to make a new package of measures and I think that's the right way to go about it not to keep saying that you know it's not doing enough it's poorly functioning or it's poorly performing but yes we all need to work together to make this happen Paul I wanted to come in and then Gina and um, so the, que the question was how realistic is it that we'll reach the targets I think um, and I don't think we should beat ourselves up too much we weren't far off the targets and there were two good reasons for failing the targets one was the rebate re um, setting the baseline um, through new data and also it's weather dependent and we know it will be weather dependent it's a challenge for for Scotland because we do have annual targets and you are therefore subjected to that but the important thing is the direction of travel where we're trying to get to we're trying to get to 80 percent reduction by 2050 and we've got good reasons why we're doing that. We're trying to, to, to control the global increase in temperature. We're making our effort small what it is, but it's still important. Um, so there's a couple of things. I think Jim is right. Actually, a lot of people are not that bothered. We could do more in terms of, of raising awareness. Um, but I think we could also report it differently. SIPA as a microcosm is in a very similar place. We're an organisation who... I try to, to show leadership, but we find it very hard to reduce our emissions for all sorts of reasons. We increase our role, we IT, uh, storage of data. There's all sorts of things that compound your tasks in terms of reducing your emissions. Um, 
I think we could, we could, the way we tell the story is very important. So there are, we, when you say we've just failed the target, these are the reasons why, if our contribution from EU ETS changes, we can explain that. But we still have to make that concerted effort to achieve it. And if you look at our PP2, uh, all the policies and the proposals, it does look like there's a way forward. Um, there are policies and proposals that you have to do the you have to do the number crunching. There is costs associated with that, and I think we need more of that in terms of looking at how what what benefits can we get by bringing policies and proposals forward, because you get that benefit for longer. So, for example, in peatland restoration, if you bring that policy and proposal forward, um, you get that benefit for the next 10, 20, 30 years. And so I think we just need to have a good hard look at what we can bring forward and not get hung up on just missing the targets. Because if you, if you change the target, we're not going to get to the aspirational place we're hoping to achieve. Um, yes, just to, to reiterate, um, I fully support what, what both Paula and Jim have said. I think uh, the importance of a positive narrative around this can't be overstated. This is all about society, government, opposition working together to, uh, to achieve what is a common cross-party goal, um, and it's a societal goal. Um, I think what people care about, to address your point, is that, uh, you know, how, how does climate change impact their lives? They're not obsessing about targets. They're not obsessing about any of those kind of details that we obsess about here. They're looking at how, how policies are impacting in terms of the warmth of their homes, their, the healthcare costs, things like that. And I think what's really important is that we um, acknowledge that climate action shouldn't necessarily be about being a burden on society. It's very much about achieving win-wins as much as possible. So um, WWF just um, launched a report very recently which looks at the impacts of uh, implementing the fourth carbon budget at a UK level. And uh, it looks at the overall macroeconomic effects of that. And that shows essentially that strong climate action leads to more GDP growth than a business as usual approach. It leads to more money in our pockets, higher household income. It leads to reduced pressure on the NHS. And that's even leading, uh, leaving aside uh, issues like um, cleaner air, all those other uh, benefits that it delivers aside from emissions reduction. So this is a win-win in terms of all the agendas that we care about, about welfare, about healthcare and everything else. If I may just very quickly address the issue of changing targets, um, I would support very much what Jim says, but I think there are another, a number of other reasons uh, not to change those targets. And a lot of that is about the, the perception that that would lead to externally. Um, I think Firstly, I think it's very bad timing to think about Scotland um, changing its course on climate action. Um, we're at a critical moment in the uh, moves towards a 2015 global deal in Paris. Um, you know, we've just seen the, the UN Climate Summit, and I know that there's a debate happening in Parliament about that today. Um, all the global leaders are talking about it. It's very firmly back on the agenda. Scotland is rightly lauded as, as being you know, ahead of the posse um, and, and acting with the, you know, the best in class on this. And Stop Climate Chaos recently released a film essentially um, promoting the Scottish example abroad. Um, so I think anything that would be perceived as weakening uh, Scotland's ambition at this point would be problematic. Secondly, um, the Committee on Climate Change uh, recently conducted a, the fourth carbon budget review for the UK government looking at the science po and politics and economics of climate change, whether things had changed enough to justify uh, altering the fourth carbon budget. And at a UK level, they found that there was no uh, reason to do so. I'm not sure that it would say exactly the same thing at a Scottish level, but what I do think is that that process created a lot of investor uncertainty in the green economy. Um, there was a sense that you know things were unstable, people didn't know where to put their money. And I think, if anything, we should be uh, providing a very strong, clear trajectory for our uh, green economy, which is thriving in Scotland, so that we can deliver all the benefits that climate action entails and not just worry about the downsides. Uh, Uta just, just to come back, I mean, I agree with you, Gina. Uh, the timing, you wouldn't want to change targets just now this moment in time in the run up to uh, 2015 and all this however just to remind you we are going to advise the Scottish government next year uh, by the end of December on the 2027 to 2032 targets my god it's so far in the future um, 
And then the Scottish Government will have to legislate them in 2016. Uh, we'll be doing RPP3 and all this. So there, there, there is an opportunity to then look again at the short-term targets as well, I think, because we wouldn't necessarily say that, that the long-term should change. So at the UK level, you're right, we said the fourth carbon budget should stay the same. However, for the shorter term things, well, we're lucky that at UK level we have no problems with the current carbon budgets and we will meet them. But it might be worth looking again at the trajectory to, well, at the moment 2027 and then the future 2032. So I think it is an opportunity when the Scottish Government looks at this in 2016 based on our advice to see whether it might be there might be a reason for changing the short term. But the long term ambition, yes, should, should stay the same. If not, it might need to be more because, um, as some of you may know, the IPCC, Intergovernment Panel on Climate Change, recently looked at a cumulative global budget. And depending on how you feel about um, historical responsibility, um, you know, countries like the UK may have to be more ambitious. Uh, Cara Hilton wants to follow on from this point, I think. Yeah, um, just um, building on what's been said already, particularly by Jim Dencham and, and Paula, um, whether you think that additional policies and proposals beyond those set out in RPP2 should be brought forward to compensate for us for the government's failure to meet the emissions targets over the past three years and support the delivery of, you know, of, 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 of achieving our targets in future. And I'd also be interested to know to hear more about to what extent you think that there's sufficient coherence across the range of government policy and whether more coherence would enable the government to meet its targets better. Um, I haven't thought in detail about additional policies and proposals other than that are in RPP2, but I think there are some in there that we could certainly bring forward and possibly... Um, implement more vigorously, shall I say. <laughs> um, one of the examples is um, our re restoration of peatland. I think there's, a, a, I think there's, um, there's good evidence now that's come out um, to suggest that we understand how much uh, carbon savings we can get, how much uh, of a carbon sink we can get from restoring peatland. I know that there's, there's money available, 16 and a half million has been made available, and not all of it has been taken up, uh, which is disappointing. So I think more action, more concerted effort to get that money taken up, to get that peatland restoration carried out, I think it would be valuable. And I also think you could think about applying that, uh, the requirement for peatland restoration further, for example, um, I've raised this before, actually, in a committee around um, wind farm developments. There could be um, offset wind for, uh, peatland restoration associated wind farm developments, perhaps with any other development that might impact um, peatland. So I think there's, there, there's more we can do with what we've got. Um, another example could be um, on agriculture. I know it's not a huge percentage in terms of the, the this emission savings, but we have farming for a better climate, which is a voluntary um, um, policy or, or, or guidelines. Um, I know that government have thought about bringing in some more regulatory rules, and I think we could we could we could work harder to do that. We're, the the the, the RPP2 depends on 90% of farmers uptaking the, the the recommendations and guidance in, in farming for a better climate now. SEPA's ex experience in our work on uh, priority catchments, well, we're walking the catchments, we're talking to thousands of farmers. Um, you're not seeing the uptake that we might in some areas unless you continue to give them more advice, more guidance, you follow it up. So I think there's more concerted effort that could be do there as well. Um, and on energy efficiency, where there's a, a, a potential huge saving, you heard this morning about a small change to the pollution prevention and control regulations implementing energy efficiency directive. That's a small example of where organisations like SEPA could be seen to be promoting it far more. I think we could do more. We're in a, you know, an organisation like ourselves, we're there to, to apply regulation, but we want to be seen as leaders as well in, in addressing climate change and 
if we had a little bit more of a, a push behind us, I think we could do more. That's just some examples. Uta Collier. Think about a couple of the big <coughs> areas for uh, abatement savings, uh, energy fish, domestic energy efficiency and renewable heat. You actually at the moment depend very much on <coughs> GB level policies, the energy company obligation renewable heat incentive. And as we've shown in our reports, there are currently big issues with those not delivering as much mm -hmm. as they could. We've said the energy company obligation should be more ambitious. Well, I think in the current situation where you are discussing more devolution with Westminster, these could be areas you could look at. And in terms of if, if you want to really deliver in Scotland, you might need to push for having more control over those because otherwise it, it is very difficult because at the moment you can't do much about the energy company obligation. I know the Scottish Government has tried to influence DEC, um, but it's, it's not, they are not delivering at the moment. Thank you. Anyone else on this point? Jim Densham and then uh, Gina. Uh, from Stock Climate Care Scotland, we're keen and we have uh, set of various points to see in the, in the transport sector more policies or actual policies on demand management. I think it's one of the things, if you asked our partners Transform Scotland to, to sit here in my place, they would be keen to talk to you about that. And um, it's not just about, in transfer, it's not just about increasing uh, active travel budgets uh, and increasing money for other budgets, but it's about m policies which actually reduce car use. So demand management is a, an important part of the policy mix. Um, to make those uh, transport uh, emissions savings. Um, certainly, I re reiterate what um, Paula said about peatland restoration. We do need to see that brought forward. And um, whilst we've seen um, government and SNH provide uh, money and you know a really good support, um, and there's quite a, there's a big groundswell of support for um, peatland restoration amongst farmers, and, and we're very pleased to be part of that and uh, move that forward. We um, and support government in, in, in that, and SNH in that. We really want to make sure that the next stage happens as soon as possible, that the budget has, that has been uh, put in place for this year and for the next year, this 15 million pounds of money would be spent and that the, the peatland plan very quickly turns into a, 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 an action plan for, for making that money to be spent and, and guiding how other pots of money, such from the private sector, um, from Scottish Water, perhaps from landowners themselves, from or, or how um, the SRDP money for peatlands is, is spent, how that can all come together so it's achieving the, you know, a, a common goal rather than just different bits of peatland restoration here and there. I think that's that's very important. So we're very supportive of that, and we want to work to make sure that 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 drives forward in the right way. Um, again, the the, the fertilizer efficiency measures is an important one. We, we must build on farming for better climate. Farmers must do their part. And, and the proposal that is in the RPP2 for fertilizer efficiency measures, uh, even though in the narrative there's no date set in the, in the tables at the back, then those, those emission savings from that proposal are there to come in in 2018. And, and obviously, that was in, in a way that we'd like to see that as the, the latest date that that could come in, and preferably sooner, so that farmers are encouraged to, to take up as many measures as possible. We've seen through greening, um, uh, grassland farmers having the requirement to produce nitrogen or nutrient management plans, which is not the same as necessarily doing a measure. We want to see the planning lead to measures, um, and that's what we hope that through the RPP2, that proposal turning into a policy would, would achieve to make farmers think more clearly that there needs to be some action on on after doing those plans. Um, and then finally, one thing that has been considered by this committee before and is in the RPP2 is uh, uh, coastal habitats, um, salt marsh, kelp beds, uh, seagrass are all excellent around the globe at uh, sequestering and storing carbon. Um, we've lost a lot of our uh, coastal habitats, uh, our, our salt marsh through the years due to development and agriculture reclaim and and as we see the climate changing, it's inevitable that we'll need those habitats back as a cost-effective buffer uh, against flooding and sea level rise. So if we start to do the work now um, 
to, to understand the carbon savings from those and, and how much we need and, and where they're best placed and how they can provide many multiple benefits, uh, that we'll be in a good place to, to plan those long-term investments around our coasts. Other points, Gina? Yes, um, just to go back to the uh, transport sector, um, emissions are still around 1990 levels there. And in the RPP2, at present, how it's described is that essentially there's only one um, formal policy on transport emissions, which falls into EU competence, which is around um, emissions standards for uh, vehicles. Um, so there are some things happening in the transport sector in Scotland, um, things like smarter choices, smarter places, funding for walking and cycling infrastructure. We'd like to see those things become formalised in the RPP2 um, so that there's clarity about exactly how much uh, is going to be rolled out on an annual basis, how much abatement that's going to deliver. Um, we would like to see travel planning um, rolled out as extensively as possible across Scotland. Um, in the Atkins report of 2009, that was identified as a very cost-effective uh, abatement measure in transport. Um, so, so we would like to see smarter choices, smarter places, and all the supporting policies that go alongside it rolled out as widely as possible. There are also things happening on, say, for instance, intelligent transport systems, speed reductions on trunk roads. That's being trialled on certain roads in Scotland. Um, at the, I think it's being trialled on the A9, and as I was up and down to Dunkeld recently, um, that was uh, you could see the speed cameras uh, being, being uh, put in place on the sides of the roads. Um, that is actually a very effective emissions abatement um, opportunity. We need to think about um, how we can roll that out more widely and that delivers safety wins as well as emissions wins. And of course, as Jim said, um, we, ne we do need to start having a conversation about uh, demand management. We can't simply just rest on our laurels and, and think that uh, transport is somehow um, going to be covered off. We need to do more on it. We need to start having conversations perhaps about workplace parking levies, about uh, increased parking charges, road user charging. These have all been potentially politically difficult topics over the last number of years, but there is a huge uh, chunk of emissions post-2020 in the RPP2, which is identified as are described as uh, additional technical abatement potential. We don't really know exactly what that means, but we need to start having the conversations about it now so that we can build public support for what might be potentially uh, politically challenging things. There is a lot of uh, food for thought in there which we'll take forward. Um, <clears throat> a small point which was raised with me by a friend from uh, France who couldn't charge his electric uh, point because the mechanism is different in France, in Britain and in Netherlands at least. Now tell me if you've come across this before, you know. Um, we've got a lot of visitors who come here and we have the charging points now at 50 miles apart right up to the north coast. So um, that's like the EU is going to have to sort out the charging uh, mechanism for uh, cars. Uh, well, you know, moving towards integrated um, but I mean yeah. what, how can it possibly be that in the, uh, across Europe that we've got different methods of hooking up to the charging point um, something I will take up somewhere else <laughs> uh, indeed so Jim Hume car park this morning a, a car plugged in downstairs so uh, good to see that at least one of us in the parliament seems to be it was plugged in direct into a three pin plug all oh, right. Uh -huh. Well, hopefully that's safe enough. <laughs> with the with, with another Parliament adapter. Electricity is paying for somebody's car to be, to be recharged at the moment. I think we'd better stop there then. <laughs> but it, it, it wasn't me. It's just to really follow on f f from where Gina was talking about that. In our briefing, we've seen some sectors already make some uh, good prog progress since 1990, and the three that have been highlighted in our SPICE briefing is uh, waste management since 1990 to 2012 reduced 58.6% the uh, uh, emissions, uh, business and industrial processes 37% in agriculture and related land, which is mentioned obviously by uh, Jim Densham as well, but they've uh, have already reduced by 26.7%. They've already heard about uh, transport, which hasn't reduced much at all. I think it's 1.2%, which is next to nothing. Just like to explore from from uh, from you all today, which sectors 
do you think really offer the greatest opportunities to further reduce our emissions? Now, I'd just like to pick up on the, the land use um, reductions that, that Jim Hume has, has mentioned. Uh, was it 26.7%? Yeah, so most of that has come from um, either reductions in cattle and sheep numbers across the country. Obviously, the, the, the methane that they produce has therefore gone down if there's less animals to produce it. And also fertiliser changes, um, reductions in fertiliser, which are really there because the price of fertiliser has, has gone up. Um, but none of these things um, are guaranteed to go on into the future, especially with, um, I think actually in, the, in your evidence that you, you've got, um, Dave Ray um, has, has highlighted some of these, that, that actually, uh, especially fertiliser, there is a, a, an issue where obviously w as more more food is needed to be uh, produced for a growing world population or there are um, changes in uh, say say Russia has a bad harvest there's, um, there's there's a need to produce more food in other places so um, that that affects many costs it affects the cost of fertilizer as well and demand and all that sort of thing so it might be that that that, that level of fertilizer use could go up or down um, and therefore it would seriously affect um, affect that 26.7 percent it might go up so I, th I think what i'm trying to say is that um unfortunately um rpp2 or government measures have not as yet really made an impact um as we see i on uh, on the, the land use on the rural land use or the agriculture emissions reductions um and if it has we don't know about it because unfortunately farming for better climate and other land use or, or agriculture policies are not really well monitored as we've already heard issues to do with monitoring we we don't know which farmers or who's taking up which measures for farming for a better climate and we can't attribute uh, emissions reductions from those measures at this point in time it's something that we we really must see government doing better on that there's better reporting and it's in farmers interests as well as everyone else's interests because as we know if if they if they are doing it that's a great thing. We should be applauding them and celebrating them as the monitor farms have done and have shown that they can have uh, good impacts. So if, and if they are not <coughs> showing that and showing a, a big take up, then unfortunately it might be that they have to have regulation placed on them, but they might already be doing it and they might be having regulation that's not really needed. So it's always better to have a voluntary approach, which is well monitored, which is well reported and understood by everyone. Uh, before we go towards um, a regulatory approach. Uh, uh, first of all, uh, we've got Chris and Uta before we have another question. Uh, Chris. Um, I think one of the key ways or areas we can get a better reduction in emissions has got to be on domestic buildings. Um, I think Uta suggested five to ten billion to sort them out and it must be said I was looking at numbers for our older properties in Dumfries and Galloway and thought 200 million was probably not out of the question just for very basic treatment um, but I think there there's a need for changes in the sort of specifications uh, listed buildings you don't want to externally clad if you start ripping out the insides you you start to have problems with them so I think there's we need to have a more flexible approach to how we actually treat buildings so we get the right sort of building breathability, um, et cetera, et cetera. But the other side to that is we, we're talking about we, we're missing your targets, but these are one of the areas where you get good public buy-in. If you've seen, you, you know, we've got one of our local housing associations has put on about 1,200 SOS heat pumps, and they're saving a huge amount of money for local people. So that's tackling fuel poverty. It's been a really positive thing. So I think there's a, a very good way to get buy-in is by undertaking work like that but actually demonstrating it. We, I think people are working really hard to do it but I think the numbers involved to bring our housing stock to a reasonable standard are pretty scary to say the least. Yeah well follow on from that I agree with you Chris. Um, this is I mean there's reduction potential across all sectors and obviously uh, we put a lot of focus on decarbonisation of the electricity sector where of course, the Scottish Government has very ambitious targets of 100% renewables. So we know that can be done, um, and there is really good potential here. As you all know, wind power, and you've already got the hydro, and 
biomass and various things. But I mean, of the other sectors, just looking at the spice briefing, uh, buildings, well, it's just got residential in here, which is homes, 12% of current emissions. I mean, in theory, you can reduce those by 80% if you do all the insulation and do renewable heat as well. But that does come at a cost. And obviously, you do need to bring people with you. So that, that was my point early on. You can't just say to people, oh, we need to do all your homes in the next year. Um, I mean, there are times in life when people are more ready to do it, say they're moving, and if there is the right incentives available, they might. But I think also back to Gina's point about all the other benefits, we often just talk in terms of how much does it cost to do and cost per tonne of carbon, but there are all these other benefits, NHS saving money by people not ending up in hospital and all this. So I, th I, I would really like to see much more focus on actually looking at the other benefits. So the budgets for health might be uh, applied to some extent in this direction as well. Yeah. You know, across that's why we have a cross-cutting approach in the Parliament that we're trying to instil in people. Um, uh, Paula, before we come to the question from Alex. Um, yeah, the, all sorts of things you could say there. One of the things I'm, I wonder whether we need is stronger sectoral targets. We have them in some parts. We have them on energy efficiency. Um, we have them on renewables. But whether stronger sectoral targets might help. Take waste management. Um, we have seen really good progress on that, and there are targets, and there are targets at a local level. We still could do more. We've actually missed the target. Um, but actually, since then, there's a lot of activity in place, I understand, particularly at cities, to try and improve that, improving um, green waste picking up, uh, kitchen waste, etc., to meet the, uh, the ban on organic waste to landfill. Um, I think sectoral targets can help. The other point I was going to make was um, around uh, decarbonising our, our electricity, um, which we are doing very well. But of course, we're still part of the UK. So actually, we're still dependent on the rest of the UK to decarbonise as well. We're doing more than our effort, and we have got lots of suitable land for, for a wind farm. But I think we, we need to, to get those win-wins if we decarbonise the, the, the grid we can then bring in electric vehicles. You'll only get the, the benefits from electric vehicles if you're running them on a decarbonised grid. Um, so you've got a win-win there if, if you do that. Um, the other thing, if you decarbonise your grid, um, you've got uh, low-carbon electricity. Therefore, <coughs> what you do in homes should differ. You wouldn't put a biomass burner uh, because uh, what we're actually what you should be doing is putting in electric heating if you've decarbonised the grid. So. If, if we put more effort there, and we have to do it at the UK level, uh, encourage it at the UK level to, to get to a place where we have, which is the aspiration to effectively decarbonise the, the electricity supply, we can then get the benefits from these other policies. Um, Alec Ferguson had a question um, on... Yeah, thank you. I wanted to return to the subject of land use, if I may, yes, of because course. Um, one of the critical areas of land use in, in, in relation to what we're discussing today is, is the subject of forestry. Um, and we have, <laughs> again, returning to the subject of ambitious targets. There are very ambitious planting targets um, uh, and um, that we are not meeting. Um, and I, wanted, I wondered if anybody felt able to comment on two aspects of this. One is the fact that we're not meeting the targets on planting. Um, but sub, sort of in subsidiary to that, I, I have a concern that while it is visually very desirable that much of the replanting that is done is of natural um, native uh, species, forgive me, um, would you agree that they are not as efficient in carbon capture as the commercial species, that we need to keep the industry, the forestry industry going? And that there is, there is an argument to be made for revisiting the percentages of native woodlands and commercial woodlands that we are replanting. And the second point on forestry is that um, where wind farm developers um, have um, established wind farms in the forested areas, they have thousands of hectares have been cut down to make way for wind farms. They are supposed to uh, undertake compensatory planting. And my understanding is that the figures are, are way behind on what they should have been doing. Now, I don't know if anybody's... Uh, I, I want to put these points to the Minister, obviously, next week, but I just wondered if anybody wanted to comment on that aspect of land use. Um, yeah, it is disappointing that 
uh, you know, the target is not being met. I know that there have been uh, plenty of discussions. Um, uh, I forget what the title is. The We Are Group, the Woodland Expansion yes. Advisory Group. Yes, so, so that was a, a group um, brought together by government to look at how that target could be met to avoid conflicts, which is you know, really good, a good conversation to have, and we should have those sort of conversations uh, more often about different issues uh, to do with land use. Um, and, and that really uh, has been useful. Obviously, I think with the new SRDP coming in, hopefully there will be a boost to planting targets with farmers going to, to bring that, you know, have an opportunity. It may not do enough. Like you say, um, there is a need to have much larger scale personally, and from RSPB's point of view, it is good to have um, native uh, broadleaf trees being planted and not all um, uh, non-native conifer trees. Um, I think uh, because it provides so many multiple benefits which are not costed uh, in the same way as, as purely having you know, the timber uh, from commercial forestry. So we must see that there are other benefits from na um, planting native uh, broadleaves, even if they're not as efficient in terms of turning uh, or sucking carbon out of the out of the atmosphere, um, and I'm not, yeah, I'm not too sure about the compensatory uh, process in terms of, you know, as you, as you say, I take it your word that, that it, it's not keeping up with um, the, the removal, um, but in the round, um, hopefully by planting there or making space for wind turbines. Um, you know that is having a good balance in terms of the uh, in the atmosphere of, of, of greenhouse gas emissions. One thing we we would like to see is is that um, and I think I made some illusion uh, made some point to what is in the um, in our submission is that on areas of peat and deep peat that we you know that we that we are careful about where we site um, uh, turbines and and wind farms, but also where we remove trees. Uh, from deep peat that there should not necessarily need to be uh, there should be a, a requirement not to to restock and there are some issues there in terms of how deep peat is and and uh, what we sh what, what I'm basically saying is we should have a, a calculator to understand the carbon balances for for all these different activities on, on peatlands um, and, and forestry removal and, and wind farms so that we can really understand what the atmosphere is seeing in terms of carbon Paula I'm going to be able to answer your exact questions, but um, in terms of planting, forestry planting, I think uh, there are more opportunities than perhaps we're, we're, we're taking up. Um, I think the Woodland Expansion Advisory Group did some good work. Um, I think there's opportunities in, uh, through SRDP to encourage more farmers to do it. I think the benefits, there's multiple benefits from that planting as well, from uh, diffuse pollution and um, flood risk management. So I think we could probably do more. I think there are some conditions associated with some of the planting through our SRDB where there's a minimum a minimum depth. And I think we could revisit that to encourage more planting because it becomes quite expensive, I think. Farmers are happy to give up two or three metres, but if you're asking them to give up 20 or 30 metres, it, they're less, less inclined. Um, I... There's been some good work, actually, through, with FCS, Forestry Commission, uh, SEPA and Forest Research, looking at um, opportunity mapping for planting, actually, across the UK. I don't know whether they've looked at particular species. I don't know the answer to that, I'm afraid. I could find out if you, if you wish. Um, but the, this is to find where's the best place to plant, and, and maybe it's not on deep peat if you're going to disturb the peat um, it's actually they've completed the work around the tea catchment area already identified places so it increases the the, the 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 time maybe in terms of how quick you can get the planting planting done if you know where the best place to do it on the compensatory compensatory planting i don't know what the uptake's like but i agree that it should be followed up i think um sepa still has 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 involvement in um giving guidance and, and we're going to probably restart the validation process for, for um, looking at the carbon balance for wind farms, um, actually with an improved tool. Uh, and it takes account of forestry, so that should be taken account in the, in the tool. It is taken account into the tool, so the, the carbon balance is, is calculated. Um, and I think what we haven't got really is, 
is mechanisms in place to make sure that they do what's expected, either whether it's plant compensatory planting or um, peatland restoration. So I think it is a, a, a trick we're missing. Okay. Um, we're going to move on to another question now from uh, Graham Day and possibly Claudia Beamish. In this. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, in a general sense, I absolutely take Jim Densham's point about properly a monitored and measured voluntary uh, approach being the way to go before we move to becoming more prescriptive. However, if we, if we look at agriculture, the government's introduced carbon audits for this sector um, within the new cap, but it's on a voluntary basis. Now, given that, that time's marching on in terms of tackle and climate change, isn't there an argument for making this mandatory and perhaps with future cap payments linked to measure performance over a period of years? The simple answer is yes. It would be. <laughs> I totally agree. It would be great to have uh, mandatory carbon audits um, for all farmers, uh, really to help them see, you know, what they're doing, and then see uh, over a period, year or two, what difference it's making. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, fine. That's <laughs> uh, that. uh, we're okay. Can we move on to the next question then, which is uh, Alec Ferguson's? question next. Um, thank you, um, one of the things we, we've discussed before on this committee is the problems associated with the, uh, the time lag in getting the data from Scotland's um, efforts, if I can put it that way, um, coming to us. And I just wondered if, if um, I know we've raised that before, I think, when, when, when Uta was here before, and I just wondered if any progress has been made in uh, improving that process. Mm. Answer that. Uh, unfortunately not. In fact, that was something our committee was very frustrated with because obviously, you know, we're trying to do a progress report from, for Scotland and it's such a time lag. So we went back to DEC, who are, you know, the keepers of all the statistics and who do the breakdown for the devolved administrations and they said, no, it's absolutely not feasible. So unfortunately, I think we're stuck with it. I think there are some problems for when some of the sector data comes in and how long it takes to do it. Does the same apply on the UK basis? Are, are, these, are these time lags no. across no, so, the UK? So what we have at the moment for the UK, we have provisional data for 2013 already. And so, right, I remember now. So what DEC does is so pr we have provisional data, but the final data, which is also what we submit, I think, to the UNF Triple C, um, so it only comes out a year later. So in March 2014, we got the final data, I think, for 2012. And it's on that final data that DEC then does the breakdown for the devolved administrations. So that's why in June this year, we ended up with the 2012 data. Whereas for the UK, we already have the provisional 2013 data. And I guess, you know, they don't want to do tw double the work effectively, because otherwise they would have to do the work for the provisional data and then the final data again. So yes, we're always a year ahead for the UK as a whole but unfortunately for everything else, we are a year behind. And the increased workload, but it doesn't make life any easier for well, us, frankly. No, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, first of all, before Gina, <coughs> uh, Graeme Day. Just, just a point of clarity. I hope I didn't misunderstand it. Is what you're saying that they actually, essentially have the provisional data, uh, but they don't want to commit the resource to breaking it down to devolved level, or they just don't have it? Well, I, I... I know they have, I don't really understand how the stati statisticians do the breakdown, so mm -hmm. I, we would need to ch check with DEC exactly how it works. I just know there is UK provisional data, uh, but, and I don't know what it then takes to do the breakdown. So entire UK or rest of the UK data that they, they release? So the provisional data is for all, the entire UK. So in yeah. other words, they have the provisional data, they just don't commit the resource to breaking it down to devolve level. They wait until they have the confirmed data and then do it. Is that essentially where we're at? 
I think that is the case, but I don't want to commit myself okay, to that right. because okay. I, 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 think, I think that's, uh, yeah, so it's a ma matter that needs to be taken up with DEC. But when we checked with them, they said it, it wasn't feasible to do. I mean, maybe there is some specific items of data for specific sectors that are not, not available, which, which are needed for the final data. Okay. Uh, Gina has a... Um, Given that uh, we have that time lag, it seems to be pretty much set in stone and there's not a whole lot we can do about it. I wonder if there is an argument for perhaps, uh, Uta might kill me here, but delaying the CCC annual report on Scotland, you inevitably end up in the CCC having to be forward looking because you don't have the data yet. And I wonder if it was possible to, to slow things up by a couple of months. And in that case, then you would be able to deal with the, the, the data that is verified and, and uh, that we're, we're confident of. I don't know, just throwing it out there as a possibility, and I don't know if there are many, many uh, practical reasons why that can't be done. I think that's a discussion that needs to be had with the Scottish Government, if, if it's something that was suggested, say, by the committee, because I think there are issues about, A, when we can do it, but also when the Scottish Government does its response. So it's not something we have explored. I mean, at the moment, it's, it's always been, well, end of the year or, or early the next year. The government's got to pay for the breakdown uh, figures that DEC does. Oh, I don't know how that works, sorry. Uh, well, that might be... One you of can the, ask the minister next yeah, week. All right, but they, well, we'll find out. Mm. But uh, I just thought you might have a view on that. Um, I, I think we'll, we'll. Did you want to raise a point at this stage? Okay. In that case, we'll try your next question then, Claudia. Thank you, convener. Uh, it's it's been um, quite a wide-ranging discussion already about turning proposals into policies um, in in a number of sectors. Could we? Um, could we ask a little bit further about uh, how how this process has been and is likely to work? Um, if we took the peatlands as an example, um, that in the um, first RPP, uh, that I understand that they weren't um, they were only mentioned, not mentioned, but they, they were highlighted. But then in the second, there's been. Um, proposals about peatlands which are being turned into policies. Uh, but I wonder the degree with that and, and other issues that how, how far should Scottish Government um, be really directing where um, these policies are going and asking for comment on it, such as in peatlands where it, w but it in, in that consultation, I understand it was quite open, you know, rather than directed from the centre. And I, and I just wonder that to that degree, I also wonder, um, just to open up the discussion even more broadly about um, the, the funding for research into future um, transformation of proposals into policies. And if we take marine um, uh, issues, for instance, this um, followed, a, 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 it's, in, it's helpful, I think, to see a, a pattern going through the different RPPs. But uh, in this, in RPP2, we have, um, perhaps a parallel with what happened with RPP1 with the peatlands, with marine issues, and then that is going to be going forward. But is there really um, the opportunities to take these um, issues forward in a way that is constructive? Um, I wonder if there are comments on that. Uh, thank you. Sure. Um, on peatland, as, um, as I've already said, um, you know, we we're very pleased with you know, what's been achieved so far and, and actually for this committee to, to have a lots of sessions on it and push it. Uh, that's been fantastic. Um, I think that, yeah, we would like to see the, the proposal that is in our PP2 made into a policy. And really that's to have the target um, that is, is in that in that document really to be made a, a policy to say Scotland is going to try to achieve that. And, uh, and it was the feeling that the, the peatland plan would give us the direction of how that would happen, um, how that target would be achieved so that then that could become a policy. And also the 15 million and any other money that comes in, you know, how that would be spent in an in a organised, coordinated way. Um, as you say, unfortunately, I, and we feel that the, the peatland plan document wasn't as... Um, not totally directive, we don't necessarily want that, but we wanted some options to, for SNH to show us how they felt um, 
a process could go ahead to make that happen in a timeline which allows us to spend the 15 million in in the budget years that has been put forward um, and unfortunately it was it was more broad than that uh, you know a, a, a good document we can't fault really what was was in there but it didn't really suggest option a is to do it in this way option b option c which do you prefer or what comments do you have it was really what what would you like how would you think this money could be spent or implemented to make peatland restoration happen um, and i feel that that is a bit of an opportunity missed and we need to shoot on now and, and make sure that we get a plan in place very quickly um, and, and get money spent in the budget arounds and also um, as I say the target made into a, a policy as early as possible. Um, on funding for research I agree that um, in terms of blue carbon and marine carbon um, as I've talked about salt marsh habitats and, and other blue carbon habitats yeah we are at that point where we need to gather the science in to understand exactly what carbon benefits there are from restoring and protecting and creating new of those new habitats of those which you can do um, what carbon benefits there will be and and therefore have enough information to turn it into a policy as soon as possible um, so it's a policy not just for wildlife and not just for adaptation but also so we can definitely say if you create you know, 10 hectares of salt marsh in the fourth, it will give this much in terms of carbon benefits to our inventory. Just before we, uh, you know, develop any of this at the moment, do you understand that the reason for not making peatland plan into a policy was that the science is being established at the moment about what the emissions controls actually are uh, in different forms of peatland? And that the reason why it is a proposal is awaiting the outcome of that science. You need to have the clarity to know that you actually have that. And I understand that that's why the government uh, made it a proposal. So therefore, it's not about having a more detailed plan at the moment about how to implement. It's awaiting the result of the figures that show what the different emissions are from different uh, uh, depths of peat and different conditions of peat. Uh, but also, um we do know that, the, well, the indications are that, that peatland restoration is uh, carbon beneficial. Uh, and we know that. Indications are. Uh, yeah, yeah, good, yes. very good indications. And the IPCC are clarifying those figures. But IPCC are also uh, have agreed, and it's in, uh, it was agreed in Durban, I understand, that you can backdate the savings that are, are made from peatland restoration. So any peatland restoration that is done now and the savings made, which we know that they will be savings now and in the future from anything that that money is spent now through the peatland plan you can backdate that so any activity that we have now if we did it now and there was, because it was a policy it would be a beneficial thing in terms of 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 our inventory so uh, i don't see any problem in in bringing that pro that proposal into a policy now and even though it may be next year that we understand exactly what carbon benefits they will it will accrue that for sure. Did you have another point, uh, Claudia? Or is that fine just now? Uh, it, it was only, convener, uh, about the, the area of farming and new technology, which came up in committee before, because um, beyond 2020, concerns about uh, what the technology will be which and, and whether there is research money there for, for, um, for ensuring that, that we can take forward um, proposals and put them into policies, so in farming. Uh, th there were a range of, of um, points in the RPP2 about new technology which hasn't yet been hardly even invented. So I think it's beyond the green cow, but um, uh, or, or parallel with perhaps. <laughs> okay, um, Paula. Can I just make a, just a, a general point on, 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 your, on your points, Corey, about asking advice and should we ask it? And I think the answer is yes. And I think the consultation on the Peatland Plan was an example of that, where you did ask and you, you sought advice. And while SEPA thinks, for example, that it does set a very good strategic plan for where you want to go, it needs to be directed by RPP2 in what we do. And there is research. You asked, It asks about research. And there are gaps in the research um, that you can fill. But it, I, you don't want... It, it shouldn't be a reason for inaction. 
if you know enough. And I think there's, there's enough evidence out there to say, yes, people in restoration works. It probably works better and more degraded and less degraded. We've got some evidence. It shouldn't be an, a, a reason for inaction, unless the consequences are, 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 are detrimental. And I don't think there'll be. Um, there was something else, but I've forgotten the other point. But, that, but I, think, I think consultation is the, right, is the right way forward, for sure. I'm sure the Minister will be listening to what you've just said. Um, other points here, we've got Gina first, briefly. Um, well, just to agree with you that I think, you know, where there are some areas where we need to improve the evidence base um, and consult on that, uh, we also know that there are, there are certain things where there are political barriers uh, to, to making progress. I think one of the really great things that we saw in the summer was the establishment of the Cabinet Subcommittee on Climate Change, which we hope will very much uh, allow uh, the government to resolve those kind of uh, political barriers. We saw you know, five new policies across different areas, so there was very much a sense in, in June of where there's a will, there's a way. And I think it would be worth exploring with the Minister uh, when he comes in next week, how the uh, Cabinet Subcommittee will work with the Climate Change Delivery Board and right across the civil service to uh, understand uh, what the evidence base is, what the barriers are, and how we can accelerate turning proposals into policies. Was that Chris? Was that... Did Chris want to say something there? Um, no, I was. Uh, okay. I, Jesus, I, was... I just can't read. The rest <laughs> that's that's good. Good. Uh, Jim. Briefly, as long as we're not reiterating points. No, that's fine. Uh, just quickly on uh, Claudia Beamish's other point about the um, agriculture research, and that is, uh, yes, in the RPP2, um, without a lot of explanation as to what it is. Um, it could be all sorts of things. For example, you know, the, uh, the likely uptake of precision farming in the future, and that's sort of being looked at as a as a as, as a saving for um, in terms of emissions. It could be other things too. What it would be good to find out from the minister is is how um, a future agriculture research budget does match up to, to achieving this. Chris, did you have anything to say about the other parts of the public sector that can uh, help in this respect? You know, um, the Public sector, I think, are committed. I suppose the big sort of issue on a lot of these things, we're turning tankers around. And I think that's one of the, the, the real challenges. It, the technology is developing. I've got a guy in the north of our region who's I think somewhere near market with an electrolysis boiler burning water effectively and will use electricity so there's a lot of technology and things out of there but it takes time to to get the policies on on board and everything in terms of our if you like the economic benefit 10 years ago I think we had a couple of people sticking solar panels up in Dumfries and Galloway uh, we've got probably 12 in Dumfries most of those of them spread into biomass and other technology so we are developing the expertise to deliver the targets we need, but it does take time to do it. And we, we find the same thing within, the, you know, within our authority. It takes time to change the attitudes, get the policies in place to deliver that. And there is a catch up. And I think what will probably happen, we will start to see better progress in time, but it does take an awful long time to get the right support. We're really fortunate we've got cross-party support for what we're trying to do with, in terms of climate change, but it still takes a long time to fit that in with financial savings within local government restructures and all the other things and to keep it up there at the right level within the agenda so i think and i think that will be the case across the public sector um, there are fixes out there technical fixes they're coming up there's some really exciting technologies you know, capturing wind energy when the when we don't need it etc but it will take time for those to actually fit into the system and become more mainstream so i think that's good um, thank you for that. Um, we, we have the implications, the wider implications for Scotland of meeting our future annual targets. For example, with uh, you know, the EU's climate target remaining, if it does, at 20%. Uh, all of our calculations in 2009 and since have been on the, the EU getting to 30%. So um, what are the implications for Scotland then? What can we do uh, if these circumstances internationally pertain? Do you know? Uh, it was something that I think the committee has reflected on before, but there's uh, there's only really one instance where we do hit our targets, which is if the EU moves to 30% and we implement all proposals and policies as planned. Um, so there is a big gap there that that 
30% target is effectively off the table now. Uh, the EU debate has very much moved on to 40% for 2030. Um, no one's really talking about the 2020 conversation anymore. Um, unfortunately, we would like we would like to see that more more ambition uh, to 2030. Um, it, it's I think it's it's about doing precisely the kind of things that we've talked about, um, identifying new policy areas, accelerating proposals into policies. And uh, I think what we have to be aware of is that the RPP2 can't be a static document just taking one point in time and having one plan. It has to flex and improve as technological advances happen, as we uh, improve our understanding of climate ec economics and technological economics. Um, as we uh, get a clearer picture of the scale of the challenge. So what we would really like to see is the RPP2 strengthen and flex over the next couple of years and moving into the RPP3 so that it's very much a live document. Uh, Paula, please. Yeah, it's actually something that's quite controversial and don't drill down too deeply with me because I don't really understand the process in terms of the trading scheme. But up to now, government has taken a position where we haven't bought any certificates. We could buy and destroy certificates. Uh, also, we haven't really explored offsetting, uh, you know, wider offsetting options. Indeed, all these uh, th threats hanging over our heads, I suppose, if we can't manage to meet our targets by the means that we've agreed just now. Um, unless there's anything very specific apart from that, Jim, is there something you're going to add? Convener, um, just one of the implications if we don't move, which it seems that we're not to the 30 percent, is the Climate Change Committee some time ago said that it, because, uh, it, well, the, the shortfall would be down to the non traded sector, which is the agriculture sector and uh, waste sector and other non traded, yeah, to, to try and achieve that shortfall, which is a big stretch. So that is the implication for the rest of Scotland that other sectors have to do much more to meet that challenge. Um, fine, Nigel Don, uh, your question, please. Yeah, thank, thank you, convener. I'm, I'm just uh, obviously sitting here listening, as everybody else is, to all the things they've said, and, and um, can I encourage folk not to repeat anything they've said? If, if and there may be no answer to what I'm about to ask you, but I, I'm, I'm just thinking we've there are on, there's an onus on government, um, and we'd all like to spend more money. If we work on the assumption that the government is trying to do the right things, and we've discussed that, and if we work on the assumption that we don't yet have a forest of money trees, so that is not the answer. Is there anything else that we as a committee or the parliament, and I guess we're the relevant bit of the parliament, can do to make progress on this that we haven't previously talked about? about that yes okay that's fine thank you i thought that was the answer uh, and that's that's fine can we can turn the question round slightly wait a minute just before you try if, to answer. if i may community i'm not having a go at jim Densham or gina hanran but can i turn this reverse this you both represent mass membership organizations and at the root of everything we're trying to achieve is the requirement for behavioral change across society so can i ask what your organizations do given the size of your membership, to actively facilitate or encourage behavioural change? I think we'll try and take those uh, two bits together. But, uh, you know, uh, if you want to come in, who wants to start off then? Was Jim going to say something, first of all? Um, I can. Uh, Briefly. I think we need to look for the win-wins. Win I know that's an easy thing to say, you know, we need to look for those positives. Uh, but... You know, we do all need to work together and look for those those really good things. Obviously, and I understand more of the, the rural land use, the agriculture sector. It, it, it helps a farmer to to do a nutrient management plan and then think about the efficiency savings. It makes sense for their business, not just for the for the climate. So, if we can, in some ways, encourage or um, propel them towards doing that, then that's the sort of thing, and, and that's the sort of thing we need to work on. It, it does mean that we, as organisations, not just government needs to be involved in having the conversations and saying we support this and being in partnership with others, having partnerships with people we don't usually have partnerships with and saying, you know, let's work together because no one is listening to RSPB on this, but they'll listen to a business sector or they'll listen to the NFUS. So let's, we need to get better at finding our 
well, resolving our differences and working together for a common good. Let's see something, Uta. Um, there isn't a money tree. That is true. Um, but just thinking about buildings energy efficiency there's there's quite a big campaign going on at the moment which i think uh, your organization uh, certainly wwf is uh, signed up to about looking at this whole issue of improving our building stock differently as an infrastructure priority and there is of course infrastructure money and if it becomes an infrastructure priority it's easier to raise money at cheaper rates etc i, I it seems some, an interesting angle, which uh, seems to be gaining traction. So I don't know how much that has been discussed here in Scotland, but I, I know that UK-wide, some of the parties are now signing up to it. So it's an option. Anyone else? Yes, Gina. Precisely. I think it's about getting creative with how we do things. It's about looking at budget lines that we wouldn't necessarily have looked at before to achieve those win-wins. So as precisely as you say, looking at the NHS budget, perhaps to, to deal with issues around warmer homes, looking at um, how we uh, invest our capital budget. So one of the things that WWF is doing in Scotland as an organisation over, over the uh, coming year is uh, looking at... Um, how we can start to sh uh, shift from high carbon infrastructure investment to properly transformational low carbon infrastructure projects, looking at identifying uh, what those projects should be and working right across um, the entire infrastructure life cycle, everyone from uh, unions to academia to industry to the green investment bank to the institution of civil engineers to government and bringing those people together to look at what are the projects that scotland needs in future that we can invest billions of pounds in um, so that's just one example of, of the kind of things that we would like to see we absolutely would like to see energy efficiency as a national infrastructure priority um, I, I think you know we, we see the scale of the challenge and it can only be tackled if we look approach it from lots of different angles it's quite an interesting point to kind of, uh, uh, you know, to finish up on because it, it comes back to our wish to have a cross-cutting approach in the parliamentary committees uh, with regard to budget and so on. And, you know, there are big questions here for our minister uh, in environment to ask the other ministers about what actually they're doing about these things. And the infrastructure clearly is a very big part of that. I think that's a message that's come over loud and clear. Uh, as uh, uh, Paula, you wanted to... A point, and it, you know, of course, the commi your committee considered how well NPF and SPP delivered on um, climate mitigation and adaptation. I think there's more we can do on there. I think it's, it's, it, it fits into exactly what we've described. It's about creating those low-carbon places. It's about creating the opportunities for people to change their behaviours by changing the way that we move around and we, we, we work and we play in our environments. It's got to be a way of uh, telling the story so that people uh, in different sorts of parts of the country understand this because where I come from with the uh, huge amount of rural poverty where it's caused by you know poor insulation, old ho houses and the need to travel in order to get services, you know, it's got a very different solution to those which are related to the cities where a lot more uh, stringent uh, measures can be done about uh, ensuring that transport is very different from what it is just now. Uh, yeah, we're glad to have all of these points. Uh, don't need to be amusing. We'll be asking these questions very much of the uh, Minister and uh, it's an ongoing situation. Uh, and I, Graham Day's point about behaviour change, very important. We've highlighted this. We'd like other people to think about that one in the organisations that talk about our targets and how and whether we meet them. Um, are your organisations doing your best to make sure that uh, people's behaviour has changed? Some of it's not the blame culture. Some of it's about, you know, uh, we're all in this together. Yeah. Indeed. Well, thank you very much, panel. That's excellent. Uh, it's uh, refocused us. Uh, we also have a, a debate this afternoon in the chamber on the, the uh, 2014 uh, UN climate meeting, uh, which I think will be interesting to follow on from this. And if you're around, we welcome you to come to the gallery. Uh, thank you for your evidence. We'll uh, be moving into private, so we'll uh, try and clear the place 
uh, fairly soon so that we can move on. Thank you. And that ends the public meeting. Uh, just now, uh, sorry, at the next meeting on the 8th of October, the committee.